In life, from the time that you wake up to the time that you go to sleep, you are presented with an infinite amount of choices. I mean, not infinite, but you get the point. From what you eat, to what time you go to bed, to how much time you spend with your family, how much time you're working, how are you spending that time where you're working. I think most of you have probably heard of the story of how Mark Zuckerberg only has one outfit that he wears every single day because it takes away, or I guess it gives back some brain capacity because he doesn't have to think about that choice in the morning when he wakes up. He just has the same wardrobe and that's less time that he has to think about thinking about it. Yesterday, I came out with a short form piece of content where I discussed in Premiere Pro, there is two types. You're either the type of person that likes to see your audio waveforms from the bottom, which is rectified audio waveforms, or you like to see your waveforms in the middle, which I don't know the proper terminology for waveforms in the middle. It's either non-rectified, unrectified, not rectified audio waveforms, just audio waveforms in the middle. Whoever knows the proper terminology for when a audio waveform is in the middle, please let me know. I got this comment from underscore go home on Instagram. He says, what is the benefit of both? Now, I would say the bulk of you in the comments to this video selected rectified. So the audio waveforms coming from the bottom. And I believe this is because that's what's default in Premiere Pro. And this question of what's the benefit of both is one of the times in Premiere Pro where I think there are two choices that you have and either of them is correct. I learned on Pro Tools and Pro Tools by default was in the middle. And I think if you learned how to edit in Premiere Pro, you probably would like to see them on the bottom. I think the real preference here is how you like to view your attack transients in the audio waveform. And what I mean by that, if you don't know what an attack transient is, is just the peak in the audio waveform. So this would be the attack as the audio waveform goes down, that's the decay. The middle part is the sustain, um, so on and so forth. So over here where I have dialogue, um, I can see these attack transients pretty well in the rectify format, but I like to see him this way just because, I, I, I don't know, I, I learned this way. <laughs> Even before I was using Pro Tools, I learned to view my waveforms in unrectified, not rectified, non-rectified version in even Windows, I think it was like Windows Audio Editor, or the, the whole point of this is that there are choices that you can make when editing in a software like Premiere Pro. And my question to you is, do you want more choices or do you want less choices? And I don't necessarily mean like new features. Obviously, everybody wants new, up-to-date, amazing features. I'm talking about the classic structure of editing a video. For example, I came out with a video some time ago, actually three years ago, according to YouTube, about how to fade in and out of video inside Premiere Pro. This video is 11 minutes in 19 seconds. This video is over 10 minutes and all I'm telling you how to do is different ways of how to fade in and out a video inside Premiere Pro. Why is this video this long? I actually had to ask myself this and rewatch this video just to figure out why it took me so long to make or basically create this video. I even point out in the comments that uh, in all honesty, this tutorial could be 30 seconds long, but I feel it's a disservice not to examine all the different ways you can accomplish this effect and explain why certain processes are better than others. The short version of this is I have to explain to those that are new to using Premiere Pro certain techniques like keyframing, because if you've never keyframed before, I have to do a little primer on keyframing before I can show you how to keyframe opacity. There's also cross dissolve, and then I go into why you shouldn't use dip to black in most cases, in fact, probably all cases, unless you're cutting between two clips. 
Then I show how to use a black video, a color mat on the top layer when you have a bunch of layers to fade to black as opposed to adding a cross dissolve to each single layer. All of these things take time. There's other comments here like, I really like your videos, how you show choice and options and how to decide what might be best for a particular situation. So this may be a fault of mine, but my thought process is when I create a tutorial, I want to show you all the different ways that you can do a certain process. Now, whether that's good or bad, I don't know, but that leads to me taking 11 minutes and 19 seconds to explain <laughs> how to fade to black in Premiere Pro. Another case in point here is I came out with a video two years ago where I try and find how many different ways I can move a clip within 10 minutes. And if you haven't seen the video, it's not really a spoiler alert because I show you different ways of doing it, but I ended up thinking of 38 different ways just in 10 minutes of how to move a clip within Premiere Pro. Now granted, having that many options for moving a clip is probably necessary in something like Premiere Pro because that is the whole cornerstone of what you're doing with this software. You are moving clips around and you better have a bunch of different ways of how to do that and efficient ways at that. One more example here, just because I think things are good in threes, um, is one of my favorite videos that I've ever created and it's how to trim and cut video in Premiere Pro and the whole video is just me telling you not to use the razor tool. Now, there are lots of processes inside Premiere Pro that I think it's completely up to you, the user, in whether or not certain ways are faster or not. And I think the razor tool can be the best tool in some situations, but in my opinion, I think it's faster to use something like Command K. But even further than that, create your own keyboard shortcut near a place where you always have your hand on the keyboard because you're always cutting files inside Premiere Pro. So just make add edit a keyboard shortcut somewhere on the keyboard that you can access all the time because at least in my style of editing, that's something that you're doing all the time, that and ripple deleting. I took uh, seven minutes in 43 seconds to explain to you what I just did in like the last 30 seconds. <laughs> this The whole process behind this video is kind of why I got into YouTube. It's one of the reasons. I used to be a senior video editor and uh, I would train other video editors at my last corporate job and it would just pain me when I would be behind their shoulder when they would be showing me an edit and then I would ask for a change to the edit and then they go, and they take their mouse and it just takes forever to go click it and then they have to kind of find the right frame and then they might not put that edit in the right place, so then they move over just a little bit, they hit undo, then they click it. Don't get me wrong, Razor Tool, it, it's definitely, it has its place, but I would have to hold everything back in my, every fiber of my being to be like, look, there is this thing called add edit, and by default it's Command K, but just move it to your own uh, keyboard shortcut. It, it, it took me a while <laughs> to understand that different people edit in different ways. And if you're able to get your idea across that you have in your brain into the computer, then how you do it is completely up to you. But my bigger question here, like I said before, is do you want more options or do you want less options in your video editor when it comes to tackling a issue or a challenge that you have in the software. I'm trying to think of the standpoint of if I'm building something like Premiere Pro, you want the user base to be able to use your software as easily as possible. And Premiere Pro has a extremely diversified user base. There's people that just wanna to put together their home videos and then there's also full-fledged Hollywood productions like Everywhere or Everything Everywhere All at Once being produced on that. They're catering to so many different types of video editors. And my thought process is if you're new to Premiere Pro, it would be easiest to have all of the different shortcut keys and 
all of the different ways to cut and trim video or color video or do anything within this software to be like one or two different ways to do it. But then as you get further along in your career, you want that minute adjustments that you can put to a certain piece of footage. And I think that's what Premiere Pro grants us. The only issue that I run into as somebody that instructs or teaches this software is that I end up <laughs> with something like this how to fade to black video in Premiere Pro that's 11 minutes and 19 seconds long. On average, when I come out with a tutorial now, I probably film the tutorial and it takes me an hour and a half the first time I film it. Then I'll film it again, um, go through the whole process, and maybe it'll take me 50 minutes. Then it will go down to 40, then 30. On average, I would say that I film in the last year or so, each time you watch one of my tutorials, I've probably filmed that thing four or five times. Um, and that's not like, a, oh, look at me and my hard work. That's more just a representation of my presentation style and how I would like to get better. So I just keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it. And I just find ways to get better at presenting the tutorial in the style that I want to. The other part of that is when I'm showcasing something, I find it easier to re-record that task in camera or in the screen record than trying to edit it together. And it's faster for me in most instances at this point to re-record things than to chop it up and try and make something better. My last two videos, actually they're, they're right here. It's how to screen replace in After Effects and how to screen replace in Premiere Pro. I originally had that video as one specific video and there are so many different techniques and tricks and doodads and all the different things that you can do with screen replacement just in Premiere Pro alone that I recorded this video and I got to the last section where I got to um, screen replacement on a phone. And that part alone took me like another hour and a half to record. Eventually I got that video down to 16 minutes and 57 seconds, but I, I you, you get the point here. Sometimes some things just take a lot longer to explain. And it's not that they can't be explained in a minute or so, Hence, YouTube Shorts, like I could come out with a YouTube Short now that explains how to replace your screen, but that one YouTube Short is not going to go as in depth with all of the separate issues that you might have in your particular case. There's just so many different ways that you can do a process like that. So I ended up splitting this video into two, one for Premiere Pro, the other for After Effects. And those videos aren't doing that well on my channel, but I'm completely fine with that because I know that the information that I put in those videos is exactly the kind of stuff that I would want as an editor if I was approaching this kind of concept for the first time. All of these things I try and tackle, or all the issues that you might come across, I try and tackle and showcase to you uh, ways to solve those challenges within those videos. And hopefully if you have something a little bit more than that, you have a good basis uh, to build off from and what to search for to learn more about that topic. I just know that when it comes to doing a certain task with Premiere Pro, most of the time you can find <laughs> So upwards of 38 ways of doing that within the software. Whether that is a good or bad thing, I think it's a good thing, but I do think that that comes at the cost of it taking longer for people to initially learn this software. There's like a threshold that you have to get to to really get the efficiency from this program. That's my two cents for today. Uh, thank you underscore go home for asking me what the benefits of both rectified and unrectified waveforms are or whatever you call them. Um, that just, all of this stuff has been swirling in my head after looking at that question and really thinking about like, huh, there, there are always so many different ways to do things in Premiere Pro, and this is just an example of them. But in this 
specific case, I really don't see a benefit or a detriment to using one or the other. Uh, maybe, maybe you in the comments have other opinions on that. So until next time, my name's Javier Mercedes, and I hope you're out there living a life of abundance. Bye.